How to stop the spiral in Venezuela. Former leaders from Spain, Panama, and the Dominican Republic are scheduled to have a go at it Wednesday, mediating a break in the impasse. It's a tall order. On the one hand, food riots, runaway inflation, power outages have escalated as services and infrastructure have collapsed in the country that's home to the world's second largest oil reserves. On the other, the government has been focusing on its own political survival as voters line up to get fingerprinted in a bid to recall President Maduro, who since the 2013 death of his charismatic left-wing predecessor, Hugo Chavez, has struggled to keep a grip as the pendulum swings against uh, what was called the Bolivarian wave that swept through the Americas more than a decade ago. We're discovering that passions are running high at the mention of Venezuela, not just in the Americas, in places like Spain, where uh, candidates in next Sunday's snap general election have used the chaos in Caracas to score points and paint the insurgent Podemos party as loony left. We're going to look at the ideological divides and the spillover effects. Today in the France Fenquet debate, the meltdown in Venezuela. With us, Venezuelan political scientist Natalia Bronlo, director of the Paris-based Latin American Studies Group. Thank you for being with us again. Thank you. Thanks as well uh, to uh, financial strategist Luis Colasante. Welcome exactly. to the show. Thank you very much. Uh, Christophe Ventura, a fellow at the French International Relations Research Center, IRIS, and the editor of the online edition of Mémoire des Luttes. How would I translate that? Me Memory of the Struggles, but it doesn't sound very good in English. Memory of the Struggles, OK. <laughs> yes. uh, uh, many thanks for, uh, for being with us from Chicago as well. Daniel Landsberg-Rodriguez, who teaches at Northwest University's Kellogg School of Management. Always a pleasure, Daniel. Thank you for having me back. It's always a lot of fun. The France Fanquette debate, where you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter, the hashtag F24 debate. Now it's major airlines canceling direct flights. Lufthansa, the latest. The German carrier says it's owed $100 million in ticket revenue. It won't be flying directly to Caracas. Authorities having a hard time converting local currency into dollars as they struggle to keep up food subsidies. And more and more are going hungry. Yuka Royer has the story. This is a country that was once billed as an economic miracle. During Hugo Chavez's time, Venezuela was among the fastest growing economies where the president lavished oil wealth on the population. Now it's teetering on the edge of collapse. We follow this mother in Caracas to a supermarket. Her shopping list is short, just some flour, sugar, pasta and chicken. But here in Venezuela, these everyday staples are hard to come by these days. There's nothing inside. There's plenty of tomato sauce and ketchup, but not a single packet of pasta. Pasta? There isn't any. There's vinegar, though. There's no sugar either. And this artificial sweetener is sold for over 4,500 bolivars. That's half the minimum monthly wage. With inflation at a colossal 700%, this housekeeper can't fill up her fridge. I haven't had a grain of rice for two months, and I haven't been able to buy sugar for five months. I feel choked. I feel so powerless. Most turn to government rations, queuing for hours to get the most basic foods, if they can get any. The president should come here once, joining the queue at 2 a.m. like the rest of us to see what it's really like. The situation is even worse in some areas, like Pitare, a poor and populous hillside neighborhood in the capital. Retired couple Miguel and Carmen Santiago have had no running water for two weeks. I get up three or four times every night to see if water has come back, but to no avail. Electricity has also become scarce. It's now rationed in 90 percent of the country. The government has even moved the clock forward by half an hour in a desperate attempt to save power, but it did little to improve the situation. Here in Maracay, traffic lights are no longer functioning and residents are living by candlelight. It's 40 degrees outside, but they can't use electric fans. Frequent power cuts have slowed down local economic activities, like this auto repair shop. Our sales have gone down by 60%. Two more months like this, and the business will be gone. I'll have to let go of my staff and pull the shutters down. The crisis has spared no sector, including hospitals. This one in Caracas is the best and biggest in the country. Inside, 
It looks almost as if it's been abandoned for years. This mother brought her own mattress to stay by her sick son's side. She also had to bring medicine from home. I had to bring all these myself, including painkillers, because the hospital didn't have any. I went from chemist to chemist trying to find them. The sick are more likely to die here than be cured. The mortality rate among our patients has skyrocketed, simply because we're unable to provide them even with basic treatment. It's frustrating. We're supposed to take care of our patients, and that's not what we're doing now. It's very difficult. We're seeing patients die every day. Venezuela's 30 million people are desperate to see light at the end of the tunnel, but that's nowhere near in sight. Daniel Landsberg, how did it get this bad? Well, this is a, a story of a disaster foretold, essentially. Uh, you had a, a, a large, as was mentioned in the, in the, in the coverage just now, uh, you had an economic boom uh, in Venezuela during much of the Hugo Chavez era, uh, but that was predicated almost entirely on high oil prices. Uh, when he came in, it was 98, uh, or sorry, it was $18 per barrel. Uh, and from a lot of the time that he was president, it was in the triple digits. Uh, that meant that the amount of money coming into the government uh, was able to create a, 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 a very paternalistic government that, uh, uh, while regulating private industry very heavily, uh, didn't regulate itself, uh, which created a lot of unwieldy, uh, large uh, public sector entities, which are now starved of money. Uh, Venezuela's economy is uh, 98 percent, uh, above 98 percent oil based. Uh, and that means that they produce very little internally. Uh, they're dependent on imports for essentially everything. And they need dollars or they need foreign currency to be able to fuel those imports. Uh, as the number of uh, dollars available to the government have dwindled, uh, and the government has uh, tried to keep up with its foreign debts as much as it can, uh, you've seen it have to cut corners elsewhere. And that includes, for example, not paying the airlines, which is why they're leaving. Uh, but it also includes uh, an inability to import, uh, which is why we're seeing the shortages uh, that we're seeing now. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's an unfortunate series of events that the government has um, made very little attempt to fix uh, because they're very strongly wedded. We have an unpopular president who is beholden for his presidency to a popular successor. Uh, and politically, the idea of separating himself from policies that were semi-functional during the Chavez era because of the amount of money available uh, that process has been very slow, and we're seeing because, the results of that now. Because, Daniel, let me ask you, is there a magic way to put food back on the shelves and medicine back in the pharmacies? Honestly, uh, that, that's a great question and one that's being asked uh, uh, quite a bit these days. Uh, even as things are now, even if oil prices were to rise to, say, $70, $80, which is incredibly unlikely, uh, in the near immediate future, that probably wouldn't be enough to stem the bleeding entirely. The oil infrastructure of the country has been crumbling, uh, and the level of faith in the government is, is, is very low. What we might be able to see uh, were there to be a credible regime change uh, would be something similar to what we saw in Argentina after the Macri election, where even before the old debts had been fully paid off, uh, new bonds and new uh, money was available based entirely on basically market and international faith that a change for the better was coming. And right, I think so, that... So that would be really the only possibility at this stage. That would be the only possibility. Daniel Landsberg, that any kind of improvement is predicated on regime change? I think any let, let, let me let me, put, let me put the question to, to Luis Colasante. Sure. <clears throat> There's several points. I totally agree that he said. I think the important point is the rent of uh, oil, petrol, and the is not quite good for the moment. We have a price of barrel of... of but he's saying barrel. that even if the price of even, oil goes up, it's not going to be enough to... Uh, no, it's not going to be enough because we have a big debt that we have to pay. Uh, 
The debt is an important point. And if we take, I saw the market today in our terminal, and we saw the credit default swap. This is the indicator to say what is the probability of default that one country can have. But it's only the vision of the market. It's not the vision of political way. So today is a more than 16 person. It's mean six zero, 60%. six zero, six per person that the market think that we are going to have a default at the end of the years. Mm. What default is, is not mean that we are going not to pay. The default is declared at the moment that we don't pay the day that we need to pay. But uh, this is, I think, this is why the country will be not recovered because we need to have cash to pay uh, this bond. And also the political of the government is to sell the gold. And we have, we use the gold reserve. And now we sell in the market and the price in the market are not so high to stabilize or to have the balances in the, um, in the budget. Right, so the, the, the money's not there. And to get m new bonds, you need faith in the system. Natalia Brandler, really, uh, there's no other way than to have regime change? There's no other way. Uh, and I would say that we tend to analyze the situation just in terms of uh, income and about the oil price collapse. And we need to take into account many other factors, like uh, Chavez and then Maduro, they destroy the production in the country, agriculture and uh, the industry. Uh, they have um, a level of corruption in the country that uh, has been really very important, um, and there are many uh, data about that. Uh, and the other problem has been the um, mismanagement uh, of the economy. So it's not only a problem of uh, oil prices, but it's also an institutional problem, and of course a problem of completely changing a model, economic model that uh, Chavez. Uh, institute, a socialist mo model, and that really has uh, brought, the col brought the collapse to the country. Christophe Ventura? Well, um, I think that uh, we, we have to follow what is the position of uh, all the governments in the, in the region, uh, and I would say what is the position of Washington today uh, where in, in this uh, discussion about Venezuela. The position of uh, the governments, uh, I mean, uh, from the right or from the left uh, is not that uh, it is first a political problem. It is first an economical problem that the Venezuela has to solve. So uh, uh, this idea that uh, a political uh, regime change would be the magical solution for everything to me uh, sounds wrong. And this is not the position of the people who are uh, today discussing in the organizations of American states, for example, uh, people from the international delegation of with Zapatero, uh, Leonel Fernandez and the ex uh, Panam Panamean uh, president believe that uh, political uh, debates, political conflicts has not to become the center of the discussion uh, on Venezuela, but the center of the discussion has to be how to improve, how to to uh, to uh, 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 get better economy. That's the discussion. And uh, we have to hope but that this point could become, um, let's say, a sort of a common platform between the government and the opposition in order to uh, uh, improve uh, the, the, the concrete reality of people in the country. And the political uh, conflicts will be solved uh, anyway, because uh, re um, recall or not recall or elections, I mean, in the next one year or eight 18 months, anyway, uh, there will be uh, opportunities for political changes in this country. Uh, I think the, the government is doing all they can to, uh, uh, to not let the opposition activate the referendum in Venezuela. Uh, they are trying all they can to uh, make believe the world that in Venezuela there are no problems like humanitarian problems. Uh, and I think we have a political prisoners. There's a violation of human rights. Uh, it's a model of where there's no separation of power. Um, the judiciary is, contr is controlled by the, by the president. They have ignored the work of the that, National the, Assembly. The push to this recall referendum is going ahead. We've seen the fingerprinting, what they said, they're up to 37 percent of those as of, as of yeah. Monday evening. They were up to 37 percent of those. That's the first step. 
of uh, of having this this recall referendum. Yeah, the opposition but... has fair and square won both houses of parliament in the last general election. So they yeah, they they won that, but uh, you may know that the the uh, judiciary is uh, all the time uh, uh, putting obstacles to the national assembly to uh, make any decisions. They have blocked the work of the National Assembly. So uh, it, it is a political problem. Uh, and I'm, I totally uh, disagree with your, with your view. I think it is a political problem that once the political problem is solved, then we might have some solutions for the economic problems. So to so solve the po politics first, the yes, economy. But that, that's what it, that the, the, the center of the debate between the government and the opposition. And your position is the one defended by the opposition. I understand this point. This is not my position. This is the one from the UNASUR, which is the Union of uh, South American States, and the one from uh, the uh, Organization of American States uh, saying today, today is a very important day because we mm -hmm. have Thomas Shannon from the uh, US State uh, Department. Yes, which is in Caracas discussing it's with the. Voilà. Official from the yes. State Department, and uh, we have also in uh, in uh, uh, the, the, the um, Dominican Republic uh, a very important meeting where uh, Jose Luis Zapatero and the two other presidents are explaining their view about how to solve, uh, how to find common uh, space for a dialogue between government and opposition, yeah, but the and that's is that what people from Latin America and including from Washington today are uh, uh, supporting the fact that this is not a political uh, re uh, regime discussion first. The first discussion has to be how to solve the economical problem for the very, country. Very briefly, Daniel Landsberg, because we have to go to the break. Sure. Uh, I, I reject the premise that there, the, the, there is a debate going on, that there are discussions going on between the opposition and the government right now. Uh, due to the intricacies of Venezuela's constitutional design, uh, if, the, if Maduro is forced out prior to January 10th, 2017, uh, the government would be forced into going to a snap election that it cannot possibly win. If he can hold off, if he can buy time up until the second month or later in the first month of January, he can essentially appoint his own successor. A new Venezuelan vice president can be appointed at any time, uh, and that president would take over for two years, which is essentially a two-year stay of execution for a failed revolution. All of these dialogues, all of these discussions, they are ways in which a failing government is buying time. Buying uh, time. Because every day it buys is a slightly better chance of being able to prolong mm. itself despite the very clear will of the people against it. All right, the clock ticking, lots of reactions on the hashtag F24 debate. Rogers on Facebook, Venezuela is a country on the verge of collapse. The writing is clear, people are tired and have lost trust in Nicolas Maduro. Honorably, he must resign. We'll be back. You're watching the France 24 debate.